So hi everyone, thanks for joining us. This is Film Grain Virtual Cinema, presented by the Film Society of Northwestern Pennsylvania and the Greater Erie Film Office. Tonight we will be discussing the documentary, The Story of Plastic. My name is John Lyons. I am a filmmaker, teaching artist, and the director of programming for the Film Society. I'm Erica Berlin, the Executive Director for the Film Society of Northwestern PA. I'm Mike Berlin, your carbon-based production lubricant. Nice one. All okay. right. Thank you. And our guests on the panel, everybody, please unmute yourselves and introduce yourselves. Stiv, you are up first. Hey everybody, I'm Stiv Wilson, and I'm the co-director of the Peak Plastic Foundation, and I am the creator, um, writer, producer of the story of plastic. Round of applause. Yeah. Um, my name is Monica Wilson. I work with an organization called Gaia. We're a global network working towards a just and zero waste world without incineration. Um, I work on our global team um, and I'm based in Berkeley, California, and I'm delighted to be here. Uh, and I am uh, Dr. Sherry Mason. I'm a plastic pollution researcher uh, based in Erie, Pennsylvania, and the sustainability coordinator at the Erie campus of Penn State, Penn State Barrett. Thank you for having us. Awesome. Thank you all for being here so much. And just a reminder for everyone participating, please use the chat and the Q&A functions along the bottom of your Zoom interface. And we'll be getting to your questions here very soon. So first, let's do initial reactions to the film. Um, before seeing this film, personally, I had assumed that most of the plastic trash that I was... Uh, you know, being a good citizen and placing in the recycling bin each day um, was being or was able to be recycled um, and not piled up in mountains, um, shredded into smaller places or pieces or burned uh, or incinerated, as it's called. Um, and I had assumed that the symbols on the bottom of all of our plastic products uh, were helping with that recycling. It's, it's a recycling symbol, right? So uh, this documentary for me, um, you know, it manages to be well-structured, easy to digest, and it's comprehensive in its purpose to educate and inform the viewer. And I certainly was. Um, I think it's an important film. That's why we programmed it. And uh, I hope that it enlightened many of us that watched it. Who's next? I'll uh, follow up. John, I would agree with everything you just said. Um, one of the things that I took away from it, I think I pledged, and maybe this was foolish, so I'm looking forward to hearing from the rest of the panel, I said to myself, I won't put anything plastic in recycling anymore because I'd rather know that it's going in that huge hill behind the casino than um, anywhere else. Like I'd rather know that that's where it's going. So um, please tell me I'm wrong or maybe I'm half right. Um, I look forward to hearing from the panelists whether I'm right or wrong. Let me go next here, I guess. All right. Well, uh, the thing I take away from the film, and I have read pretty extensively about, obviously, environmental issues. Uh, the thing I took away, and I think that this film accomplishes exceedingly well, is that we have to stop just thinking about uh, pollution or uh, these issues uh, just from a local level. You know, the idea of act locally, but live globally. And I think the film does an excellent phenomenal job of sort of interconnecting the different communities around the world and why we have to start thinking about these things on a on a greater scope and on a greater level because it's just like we can't we have to stop thinking of it it's like oh that's thailand's problem that's indians it, it is a world problem i think the film i i've seen it done on in other documentaries but i, I thought it was 
exceptionally crafted in this film. So that, that was my big takeaway about like sort of the global community as a whole. Thank you, Monica. Do you want to share your opening thoughts? Sure. Um, I feel like I'm in a privileged position because I was so thrilled to um, sort of you know, watch this this film grow, and I I'm a super super fan. I think it's um, it's such an important truth telling tool that opens our eyes and gets us really talking um, about the system. Um, and I it feels like as I've read about the IRG proposal and read about what's happening in the area, it feels like this is a microcosm of the same themes. Um, we have this fossil fuel industry that's gone unchallenged for too long. Um, plastic waste hitting a crisis point, and then this whole myth that you can burn waste and burn plastic to try to get rid of it, um, and you know, ignoring the, the whole new set of toxic consequences that comes when you do that. Um, and then I think it really also doesn't leave you in despair. It leaves us remembering that local organizing wins, and that um, local organizers are heroes. And, um, and like Mike said, we have to connect across borders to interrupt this, uh, this current economy that's so linear, that's so um, extractive and, and, and really change it around to be an economy that's based on people's right to a safe and healthy environment. I feel like it addresses all of that together, which is asking a lot and it did a great job. Thank Aimless you. plug for Monica's organization, Global Alliance for Incinerator Alternatives. The story of plastic would not have been possible without their network and the reputation in their network. They connected so many people for us as filmmakers. Um, so very grateful for that. I know she won't claim it, but I'm going to claim it for her. That's a brilliant point. Um, I don't know. I, I I'm so entrenched in the the whole um, science of of plastic and plastic pollution that um, it's I, I come from it from a very different perspective. Um, I I just want to kind of bring it home into the fact that to me, this film really connects what is happening here in Pennsylvania to the whole rest of the world. Hydrofracking is happening downstate. We have an ethylene cracker plant being built in Beaver County that is going to take that wet fracked natural gas and turn it into polyethylene that is then going to be shipped here to Erie, Pennsylvania to be turned into plastic products that are then going to be shipped all across the world. And, um, you know, it's, it's so poignant to us here um, <clears throat> to really, you know, kind of realize how what is happening here in Pennsylvania, it so dramatically affects us. You know, just there was just a, a report came out, what, maybe a week, 10 days ago, talking about, you know, kind of the boom um, crash cycle of hydrofracking, how it's, it's leaving people behind and it's hurting our state and our citizens of this state, but connecting that to what's happening all across the world and understanding that what happens here connects us through the water that is the Great Lakes that we live on, you know, um, and that is being um, polluted to, to, you know, ever increasing val numbers. Um, what happens here doesn't stay here. Um, so I really appreciate the <clears throat> the fact that it was it, it it wasn't just about plastic pollution. In fact, very little of it almost is about plastic pollution. It's really about that whole life cycle. Yeah, I mean, Stiv, maybe, uh, and thank you everybody for your comments. Uh, Stiv, maybe jump into you know the organizing structure of the film and you know basically setting this up as being the definitive, um, you know, taking you, you know, from from. Uh, you know, the fuel in the ground all the way through the, the process. Um, was that always an aim of the film to, you know, to serve as a tool that was kind of filling in all the blanks and covering all bases at once? Or is that something that over time, um, the scope of the project increased? You know, generally speaking, it was our intention from the beginning. Um, 
And I think what's what's really interesting is the network that a lot of us work in has um, advocates at very different intersection points in the system. And, you know, often as advocates and, you know, Dr. Mason just said this as well, is you tend to get siloed in your sort of what's right in front of you. And so part of it was too, as a, as a tool to, to help advocates and bigger organizations understand how everything is connected. And, you know, when we finally finished it, uh, that was pretty apparent to even the subjects of the film. They didn't actually understand entirely how their work was relating, um, you know, in in real time to other parts of, of the system. And, you know, and that was just, to me, so fascinating is, is you know, to find a, a packing slip in Surabaya, Indonesia from a, from a waste export facility in Long Beach, and then connect organizations in Long Beach, um, Al Galita, who discovered the garbage patch in 1997, um, now has a very strong relationship with Ecoton in Indonesia. And so, and we saw these kind of connections happening and it was sort of, our, our theory was, is that if we can create some true intersectionality in this film, we can help to shift a narrative um, amongst advocates on, on how we actually approach the strategy for solving the problem. And so um, the, the vehicle by which, you know, we did that was, you know, you can tell a system story, but often they'll be pretty dry or you can make an infographic or, you know, people won't read it or, or that kind of thing. But connecting the personal lived experience of of what the harm is in their community and then what the solution is in the community to sort of amplify each piece of the system with a very human face was was what we were after ultimately. Thank you for that very much. <clears throat> Mike, were you you jumping in? Yeah, if you don't mind real quick, uh, instead of if, you, if we can keep it on you. Uh, from the filmmaking standpoint, you're dealing with a situation that that's still sort of uh it's still uh the ball's still in play and uh as you guys were moving along as storytellers and filmmakers and stuff like that was it at any point in your filming and as you were constructing it uh did you find yourself having to sort of alter any of your narrative or for the most part was it like it was like you knew where you were going from point a and it sort of followed along that trajectory to point b i think i think we had a lot of parts of the system mapped out with the with subtraction of sort of the petrochemical build out threat. That was sort of, we that piece of the film came in almost direct response to a report that Center for International Environmental Law um, put out in the series they're calling Fueling Plastics. And that was, that was such a gut punch to a lot of people who've been working on the downstream parts of the system. Um, to see what was coming, what was literally coming down the pipeline. And, and when, and so we, we were like, we need to include that piece. Um, but, you know, I wasn't super experienced in networks that were, you know, these are a lot of climate activists or, or, or toxics campaigners who've been fighting this stuff for decades and decades and decades. And that, that a lot of this stuff was being fracked for, for plastic, um, wasn't actually the narrative that they were campaigning on um, at the time. So same fight, same villain, sort of different framing. And I met Yvette at um, a strategy meeting um, where we were gonna start trying to build out a petrochemical representation and um, strategy for you know how to engage in that part of the system. And I met Yvette and, um, you know, it's tough. I mean, like, there's a there's a lot of people in, in Houston that are bearing a brunt of this, and they've been screwed over by a lot of filmmakers before, frankly. And so we did a lot of trust building in real time with, with the vet. And, you know, it, it worked. The vet's on my board at my new organization. So um, uh, uh, very grateful to to her and her team on on agreeing to open up Houston. And um, yeah, but that part of the film 
was was pretty interesting because we were we were discovering this stuff sort of in real time. We had um, Carol Moffat from CL. Uh, like with three days notice I said you got to fly in we need your voice in this piece and and he did and so um, yeah it, that that part was the hardest for us to map in the beginning um, whereas the other pieces of the story we were well versed in the networks dealing with them and vis-a-vis -vis Gaia um, to get us there okay so Monica um with the proposed plastics plant um, for Erie, uh, that's proposed location is right along the bay. Um, a big purpose of a lot of their plastic is to flake it and ship it across Lake Erie to Canada where it will be incinerated. Um, I'm curious if you can give us a little more background on how incinerating plastic, because anybody that's ever stood over or near um, burning plastic, uh, you know, knows that it doesn't it doesn't seem like a good um, option. How did how did this become an option? Is this a lucrative um, business model to be incinerating plastic waste? Well, I'll start with the last question. Um, I don't think this is a lucrative business model. I think we've seen similar efforts fail quite a bit um, over the past decade or so when, when folks have tried to do something pretty similar. Um, and I think it's kind of a, you know, entrepreneurial effort to try to turn something that is a waste product into something that has a benefit. And I think we can take that too far. Um, like there's times when you have to say, wait, what's reasonable? What's the right thing for the environment, for the planet, um, for our local economy? And um, in this case, this proposal does not look like that, uh, like the right thing for any of those. Um, from a pollution perspective, what happens when you burn plastic is you rarely just, you don't burn just one plastic, right? There's all these different types of plastic. I think um, we've all experienced that in our own lives all the time. So we know there's lots of different types of plastic. They're made up of different chemicals. They have different additives. Um, some plastics have thing like, things like flame retardants added to them. Um, that, you know, you find that in a lot of electronics, electronic casing. Um, a lot of plastics include chlorine, which is this whole set of plastics called PVC. Um, PVC, uh, PVC is full of chlorine. It's a, it's a major building block of that chemical that, that is PVC or vinyl. Um, and a lot of, and, and so those, I'll, I'll use those two chemicals as an example. When you burn um, brominated flame retardants that get added to electronics or other consumer products, or when you burn um, chlorine that's in PVC, you're going to end up creating dioxin. You're going to end up creating different types of dioxin. Um, and these are considered persistent organic pollutants. So they build up in our bodies. They um, they end up in the air, they, they transfer through air currents very easily through wind, through rain, and get transferred all across the globe. In fact, you find um, persistent organic pollutants centralized around the Arctic, and those were not all burned at the Arctic, right? So from all around um, the globe, these chemicals are moving through the air. And so, of course, being in proximity, being nearby, like 40, 50 miles, is not something you want. You don't want to be um, that close to a a plant that's burning on purpose a large quantity of mixed plastics. And I think when you get to the technicalities of this proposal, trying to avoid that from happening, it's just not possible. So I think there's, um, there's a lot of uh, sort of folks who come in with this technology mindset who think, well, I can come up with some sort of technology to fix that. And the truth is when you mix lots of materials together, it gets really hard to fix that because it's so much stuff mixed together um, and so much stuff that was designed to not be unmixed, you know, that comes all packaged together, gets crushed, gets compacted. You, you can't unmix that. So um, I think the idea of, of a plant to unmix that doesn't make a lot of sense. It's a huge amount of um, sort of intellectual energy to try to fix a problem that we that shouldn't exist that we need to to unmake so we need to go further upstream and prevent the problem versus just try to find some new technology 
Sam or Stiv, do you want to jump in on the incineration uh, topic? Can I ask Monica a quick question? Monica, so uh, one of the things that the CEO and founder of IARG is sort of um, claiming uh, is that they are going to be able to automate the system <laughs> of the of the of the plastic and then the microplastic. This is totally hogwash, right? That like this is not something that it seems like it's really capable of doing no matter how intellectual uh the software is that they're claiming um i mean they can throw a lot of money at different types of sorting technologies right <laughs> so i think a lot of it comes down to how much money are they willing to throw at it um but will it ever be will any type of that type of automatic um, optical sorting ever actually be able to come up with some sort of um, set of stuff that has all the toxic stuff pulled out? No. And and even if it did, we're still talking about um, continuing the fossil fuel uh, path of burning that fossil fuel, putting all those emissions, climate emissions up back in, up into the air and adding all that carbon to the atmosphere. So um, I think it's sort of a, um, a distraction to think we could come up with optical sorters that's going to fix all of this perfectly. You know, you could you could sort out the higher value stuff that maybe could be sold for recycling, which is a small part, right? Maybe you do that. I don't understand how the economics of that are going to pay for all of that equipment. And then I don't know that they're going to be able to sell a bunch of mixed plastic waste to anybody because I think that's a pretty risky proposition and we've seen it not work. Well, I did a little bit of research on the founder, Mitch. I don't necessarily think he's looking for long-term uh, profitability. I think he's trying to do a short-term short -term game because if you do any sort of research with how he used to operate under the International Steel Group, uh, which was founded by uh, Wilbur Ross, uh, there's a lot of like, it seems like they're pulling a lot of the same uh, game plan with what they used to do with, with some of the old uh, steel mills with Bethlehem, Acme, and Wareton, which they eventually, they just turned around and sold and then sort of shipped off overseas to either India or China. So there's some interesting things that they are doing from an economic standpoint that are environmentally very alarming, but that's a whole problem. Interesting, you're saying that thread, yeah. Yeah, oh yeah, I, I started going down a weird wormhole wormhole of him that was like i was like this is alarming and he even did a little bit of a rebranding he's no longer mitchell he's mitch which i think he's thinking that's more <laughs> uh environmentally inviting so. well there is a question um from from the audience here from margaret taylor um, her question is, IRG claims that they are going to use the plastic flakes in place of coke in producing steel. Is this incineration or something different? It's really hard to find out anything about this process. I can take that, but I've been talking a lot. Do you, Sam, do you want to answer that or, <laughs> or anybody else? Um, I actually don't. I mean, I would... Uh, we call this process when you take mixed garbage or any garbage, um, and, and this is plastic garbage, so let's be clear, um, and, and burn it in an industrial facility, that's called co-incineration. It's, a, um, it's the, the burning in a boiler or some other industrial uh, process in order to fuel these industrial operations, right? Um, we see this sometimes in cement kilns. I don't, I'm, I don't know if you have any cement kilns near you, um, but but some cement companies um, have tried to replace other fossil fuels with plastic fossil fuels or, um, or mixed waste. And um, it's not as easy as they, you know, they often say it's gonna be because, it, because of what I was talking about before, all this stuff is mixed up, all these different chemicals are involved, I'm included, and it's, it's really hard to unmix that, that big mixed pile. Um, so, in a, from Gaia's perspective, from like a regulatory perspective, it's like it's co-incineration. It's regulated differently. I actually don't know how it's regulated in Canada. I don't know what legally they would call that. Um, in Europe, it would be called co-incineration. Um, in the US, it's in a murky territory of burning waste in industrial facilities. 
Um, so I think in a way it's a name game, to be totally honest, what do you call it? But if you if the process is you're burning waste, you're burning waste. So so there's a follow-up question to that then. Um, Sue asks, so just to be clear, I should not bother recycling even plastics number one and number two. They would be better placed in a landfill. No, okay. So this this touches on a, a point that you made, Erica, and I, I'll jump in here. Plastics one and, and two, in the city of Erie, if it's a bottle, put it in your recycle bin that can be recycled. And Lynn Armel is on the line, so she can correct me if I'm incorrect on that. But basically, if it's a bottle, put it in the, the recycle bin. What we really need for people when it comes to recycling is to, is to recycle smartly um, and to be aware of what you can and can't put in the bin so that what is actually put in the bin actually gets recycled. Um, and instead of um, what is called wish cycling, and if anybody hasn't watched the John Oliver um, take on plastics that came out a week ago Sunday, you should. It's fantastic. Um, don't have small children in the room. Um, but but um, he talks a lot about this wish cycling. So putting things in the recycle bin that you wish would get recycled, that contaminates everything. And so um, ones and twos you should definitely put into the recycle bin. Recycle what you can and do that well, and then only put things in the trash can that you know can't be recycled. Um, I want to also, while I have the floor, kind of take us back to IRG just really briefly to kind of explain just a few things I think that are important um, as we're talking about this facility, and I don't want to get too much into the weeds on it, um, but I do think as we're, we're talking about it, we need to be accurate um, so that it doesn't get cast as though um, um, <clears throat> just crazy environmentalists against this facility and they just want to take us back to the Halcyon days where we're living in caves and, you know, um, the, the facility is will be able is going to use infrared technology and puffs of air in order to separate different plastics so the ones the twos the threes from each other and it, it can do that and initially it's going to focus on the ones the twos and the fives to separate those from everything else um, and it can do that well that part of the technology that part of the plan is is accurate and possible um, and the ones, the twos, and the fives can be recycled locally because there are companies that use, you know, PET, that use polypropylene, that use that high density polyethylene. The question is what happens with the rest of it. And that is what they're planning to flake and, and send to, to Canada um, to be um, included into, um, uh, um, you know, steel making um, in place of Coke in a steel making process. I just think that, I mean, it, Let's let's call it for what it is and be as accurate as we can in our language and discussing kind of the pros and the cons. So um, in that in that regard, um, that part of the business plan is accurate. Now, whether that is financially viable is is a you know I'm not an economics person, so we'll get to to the economics. They obviously think, um, but in Monica's point of how much are they willing to invest? Well, it's not their money, but they're willing to invest a lot of other people's money in this. So I think that their current estimate is a hundred billion dollars. So. Stiv, if you can just jump in really quick, uh, you know, traveling a lot, making this documentary, and I know um, I want to get into to your also your perspective of plastics in in the oceans um, because I know you have a lot of experience there as well. Um, how many, you know, plants have you seen or visited that? Um, are successfully recycling um, these numbers that uh, that Sam just talked about versus the amount that's um, you know just kind of still there as trash being burned, being flaked, piling up. Like from your perspective, traveling you know the globe. Um, in in your opinion, does this seem like uh, like a good a good business model? Um, is, is it a business we should all be getting into and lining up? I think, you know, for it to be a good mo business model, 
it has to be regulated. And I'm just speaking directly of recycling uh, here. There has to be incentives in policy for recycled content and um, infrastructure investment, but that needs to be paid for by the producer. And it also, you know, to uh, I think Art's point here, you know, this is the problem with with corpor corporations and the idea of limited liability is if you go out of business, you know, the burden of your pollution goes on the taxpayer. And so, and we could make a very, very, very long list of, of how much cleanup we've had to pay for at somebody else's profit. Uh, because as soon as it, it starts looking bad, they get out. And, and then there is no, you know, there is no, um, uh, justice there uh, for for those kind of operations. Now, you know, I think when we talk about recycling, what we mainly do in the United States is we collect stuff for recycling. Domestic capacity of recycling is pretty low compared to other places. And that recycling industry, you know, what, what I was looking at, you know, mainly, uh, over the course of this was community initiatives who were inundated with waste and pivoting from agriculture because agriculture became corporate owned, more automated. And so people were leaving the countryside to find work in the cities. And waste was one of the things um, where they could make a small profit. That said, the impacts of that kind of unregulated ma and pa recycling is, is insane to the people who are working in the facility and also, you know, the watersheds associated with that facility. And so, you know, we saw all sorts of backyard recycling and it's really predicated you know, as Shibu says very plainly in the story of plastic, he says recycling is possible because of poverty. And so, you know, it, it is not fairies and unicorns that are doing this. It's, it's getting packed, bailed, shipped overseas, usually a small amount of managers, um, you know, uh, are benefiting from or, or profiting from this, but that shared benefit is, is very limited um, to, a, to a group of three, four or five individuals with a workforce of thousands. So, you know, one of the most iconic things we saw was a, a, a massive recycling facility in um, Northern India. And a woman's job, a, uh, 10 hours a day, six days a week, is to remove the little ring around the cap of medicine bottles that you know when you undo the, the polypropylene cap there's that little ring that's left around and she was totally exposed exposed to whatever medications were in those bottles whatever residue was in there which is incredibly and she's sitting in a heap so uh, of this stuff and there's no ventilation there's no um but people are doing this to survive they're not they're not doing it because you know they they have a choice so to speak so it's it's this sort of like indentured servitude um and and you know it's 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 really hard to to see because you, you know i have the privilege of of having been educated by so many colleagues on the science and the toxicity and the the health issues associated with this stuff but none of that information is provided to workers, you know, especially in, in, in places where governments can be bribed to look the other way, you know, for a business interest, which is everywhere on planet Earth. Some is more overt, some is less overt. And, um, and you know, that's, that's the real situation. So, you know, and, and when we talk about, you know, what people are exposed to is the cheapest way to get rid of of waste is to dump it illegally. That's it. You can never beat that business model. And um, and then, you know, like incinerator ash in India, we were seeing 
going directly into a landfill. We even saw an incinerator in a landfill and that bottom ash is going directly in um, to like the dairy um, that you saw in, um, in India that was depicted in the film. There's an incinerator in the background dumping that ash straight into there and the, there, is, there is leachate coming out of that that cows are drinking as a water source and then that milk is being sold in villages around there and so like the exposure pathway you can actually see it in one sort of um you know panoramic picture of, of like how it's getting into human beings and and that's what i saw you know almost everywhere it, it and you know you can't you know in indonesia we saw sachets or the you know the little small packets being burned to boil water to make tofu. Um, and, and that ash is going directly into the rice fields, uh, like literally shoveled out the back into a rice field. Uh, and that's, you know, I think it's hard. I, I think it's really hard when people are like, you know, we, we are very much a all or nothing society. And we say like, should I not recycle now? Because I saw that there's problems with recycling. The answer is we have to fix the, that system. And in order to do that, we have to eliminate some of the components that don't work in that system. Um, and then we have to ensure that, you know, there's, you know, we are not violating human rights in the process. And that, you know, for those people engaged in that work, that there's a just transition for them to other work that is safe. Thank you, Erica. We have some questions. Yeah, we have some questions from Q and A. Both of them are from the Benedictine sisters, so I'll read them both. Um, first, is the movement for divestment from fossil fuel a helpful way to reduce plastic production? And then the follow-ups are: when there are at least two lobbyists from the fossil fuel industry for each legislator at the PA state level, getting governmental action is particularly difficult, but still important. And then are there effective consumer actions that are helpful? So there's a lot to unpack there. Um, divestment from fossil fuel, helpful way to reduce. Uh, what's happening the PA state uh, level with um, legislators. Um, government action is particularly difficult, but important. And then effective consumer actions. So um, politics, fossil fuels, consumer actions. Where do we want to start? Mute, Sherry? Stiv should go first. I just went, but um, yeah, I think divestment is um, a really good strategy. It, you know, if the good news, the really good news is the economics of fracking and um, turning the stuff into plastics, um, shale gas to plastics is, the economics are terrible. Like this industry is is a fake industry. It, it like, if it did not have subsidies, local breaks, um, tax incentives, um, uh, constant influx of capital, which is, is sort of, there's, you know, when you look at sort of in, investment, um, investments in the sector like what i think a lot of people don't understand is like a fracking well is very profitable typically for one year and then it goes to about 50 percent of, of production and i'm speaking generally here at that point it is unprofitable but if you're constantly drilling new wells you can sort of game the system on production but but truth be told if you weren't drilling new wells this would not be profitable and so um, and if you look like in the, the, you know, S and P fossil fuel company companies, you know, historically were about a third of that. And now it's down to about 2%. So the economics of this, this industry are falling apart. And it's, I think from a consumer action standpoint, I, I don't know that we can do anything as consumers. I do think we can do things as citizens. And we can hammer and infuse our messaging 
you know, if we can shift the narrative and get, you know, every VC to look at the oil and gas industry as DOA, that's a that's a good hack of the narrative, um, because you know this has been propped up for so long. And I'll I'll just focus on that part of the question and, and let my colleagues hit some other pieces too. Um, totally agree with what Tim said. Yes, I, I, we have to take on the fossil fuel industry, and that's I, I think why this whole life cycle is so important. We we have to see they're connected or. We could try to, you know, juggle all the recycle or I'll sorry, all the plastic in the world and we'd never get anywhere because we're just being, you know, drowned and so much more coming. So um, I think the divestment movement from fossil fuels is super critical at a, you know, at a meta level to you. And, um, and that's, we just have to keep hammering uh, on that and the need for, um, for accountability from that sector. Um, I think the consumer action question, I feel like we always have to figure out how to politicize ourselves and our consumer actions because um, as individual consumers, you know, there's, we're pretty limited in our power, but um, so I think connecting with the community and really asking these big systems questions and helping our neighbors and families and our communities understand the, the connection to um, all these different local impacts and also the opportunities and power we have to build the economies that we want, to build the systems we want locally, because that's where we can have um, such a big impact is, um, is super important. So like, you know, rebuilding the system locally feels like the most effective consumer action um, while building our political power and, and our economic power um, in terms of things like divestment. So I think you've clearly got that all connected already by asking all of those questions. <laughs> Um, Sam, do you want to take the question about uh, the state? <laughs> the state. Um, well, I think Stiv's point about being um, engaged citizens, and it's it's difficult when you do have lobbyists, um, but you know, getting out there and, and making those phone calls um, as much as you can. Right now, the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act was reintroduced last Thursday. So really encourage people to get on the phone and start hounding um, anybody who will listen to you and 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 those automated answering machines, um, you know, to to support that legislation because that's the um, the legislation that needs to happen. It's extended corporate responsibility. It's it's um, asking for required recycled content in materials. Uh, it's it's a lot of the the policy um, points that are made at the end of of the film, um, and with regard to you know kind of what consumers can do in that question, um, I I think the film makes a really good point that that look we can do things on an individual level and that's not going to, the, the real things have to happen at a systematic level. And so that's where kind of supporting this legislation is terribly important. That being said, I do think it's important that we walk the walk. Um, you know, I, I say when I give talks to, to, you know, community groups, if I walked in drinking water out of a bottle of water and, and, you know, writing with a plastic pen and, you know, and carrying a plastic bag, like people aren't going to listen to me. You know, you've got to, you've got to, to be willing to make the changes within your own life if you're going to say that these things need to happen at a societal level too. And so earlier, you know, somebody asked about number ones and twos, even better than putting them in a recycle bin is never to have them in your house, right? So there are definitely things that you can do as a consumer. I get my, my shampoo and my conditioner delivered to my house in stainless steel reusable containers that get shipped back and get refilled. And, you know, I use a stainless steel straw and I have stainless steel and glass containers all over the house and I take my coffee with me and I get it refilled you know so you you know you find and there's so many things out there you know so many um, uh, resources, web resources to, to make those changes in your life and really encourage people to, to take one challenge at a time. Just say I'm not gonna I'm never gonna buy another bottle of water unless let's say you're in like you know, <laughs> I don't know, um, the Ukraine and someplace where the water is really not safe, Flint, Michigan. Okay, then 
you know, okay. But aside from those situations, for the most part, drinking tap water is perfectly safe, right? And so you make this promise to yourself that I will never buy another bottle of water. I will never take another plastic bag, you know? And, and I've, look, I've, <laughs> we set a target once. I mean, this was 10 years ago and got into a, an argument with the, the woman who insisted that I had to have a plastic bag. And so I, I was like, all right. And then there was a security guard and I walked up to him and I said, can you hold this for a minute? And he held it and I grabbed my stuff out of it. And I said, thank you. And I walked out of the store and she watched me and I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like, it's taking, it's, you know, taking those steps um, in your own life, I think are a critical kind of piece of that. That also changes the economics, right? Um, as industry, you know, they're seeing it with the fossil fuel, right? As we're driving less, they're turning to plastics as, okay, this is the how we're gonna get rid of our fossil fuels. Well, if we're not buying the plastics, then that makes the economics change a little bit too. I do understand, I do not disagree with the fact that we need the systemic changes. We need those policies put into place, absolutely. But also take it onto yourself to make changes in your own life. And there's so many resources to do it. Yeah, that's a great, those are all great points. And the options are so great now for, I've seen so many cool, like get a glass, you get a glass thing now and you just get a little tablet and you drop a tablet in, you know, they send tablets to your house. I haven't tried this, but I'm really interested in doing it. Blue land. Yeah. Blue land. Yeah. I want to try this. Um, so we've got some interesting comments from, from uh, one um, of the attendees about corporate responsibility in particular. And I thought this was really interesting um, about uh, someone who you know, might own a company here about owners putting aside like surety bonds or escrow accounts to prepay if there's an accident or cleanup that's necessary uh, when there is, um, you know, when there is a, a plant like this that's doing any kind of incineration or something like that, 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 that might be interesting, especially when, you know, you have any kind of plant like this that might be in an area that has, that is an environmental justice designated area, things like this that are in our backyard. One of the uh, letters that I think the, um, John, correct me if I'm wrong, but the Green New Deal Coalition here in Erie, like, the letter that was sent out to our local city council and and other local air yeah um you know local leaders about um the impact not just that the specific plant would have on the environment but what about all the um downstream if you will impacts that something like this has like on the roads and what about the people's lives that live around this kind of plant, the people who work there, just like we were talking about earlier. So what do you think about something like that, like a prepay accident or cleanup escrow account or surety bond? That's what they did with the uh, tires to energy facility that was originally planned for Erie, Pennsylvania. And the fight here got so bad that they moved it to Meadville. They they did eventually get approved. The, the the community action group ran out of funding, but they were able to push for um, funds to be set aside at the start for us to do for the for the the community to do testing and, and sampling before the facility was built, and then um, at certain years down the line. Um, and so that money was set aside and then, you know, the fracking boom happened and they decided that burning tires wasn't, you know, really um, economically viable anymore and the facility was never built. Um, so there's, there are precedents for such things. And maybe, uh, maybe Monica and, and Stiv have other. Um, I, I think, you know, it's always a question of what tactics you're going to use, but it, it does seem like it's really important um, because companies always get out of things of, you know, paying for the cleanup. I think um, you certainly want to do anything you can to protect yourself up front. And, um, and you know, demanding that funds get set aside um, in, a, in a way like that that's, that's transparent and clear versus a sort of vague commitment is obviously going to uh, be, you know, could be really important and could be a powerful tool. Um, 
So I think that's a really interesting example you've you have already used. Um, I think on the the point that um, one of the participants made around that Art Leopold made around these uh, this facility being cited or proposed for an environmental justice designated area. Um, he mentioned it's particularly cruel, and I totally agree. And that's obviously not just the case in Erie. That is that is um, where most facilities that are polluting that that um, other communities with means will fight. Um, those, those facilities get built in environmental justice communities. We've done a lot of research um, with academic partners looking at where the US's incinerators have been built. And um, over three quarters of them were built 30 years ago in, in communities of color primarily and also in low-income communities. So this, um, this really clear, um, worse than a trend. This, 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 this really clear situation is, um, is true not only in Erie, it's true around the US and it's, it's true around the world. And I think we always need to be lifting that up because um, that's a reason to say, wait, we need to go back to the drawing board here with this entire type of project in general, across the board. Um, you know, environmental justice communities have been burdened not only with waste facilities, but all sorts of other polluting facilities, right? That um, that's what's happened around the world, not only the fossil fuel industry, but but many other types of operations. So um, it's really important to look at the whole picture and, and not say, oh, well, this is one isolated plant. No, this is a community, this is a system. And so what is the full um, systemic impact of all of these different types of facilities? And how do we as a community take that whole system into account um, and look at all of the different cumulative impacts that, that the communities face? And I think there's, you know, to that point, I think we really have to understand the adversary in a deeper way. And, and it's not just that it's unfair that, you know, poor and minority communities are, are, are taking the burden of this. The system is predicated on that. Like we have to understand that it's that level of systemic racism, which allows these things to, to exist. And they target places purposely working on an asymmetrical strategy to keep certain races and cultures down so they cannot fight back. And, and you know, I mean, what we're seeing in Georgia right now is directly related to the, the um, Democrats having all, you know, three branches or, or sorry, not not they definitely don't have the judicial branch. Um, the uh, the executive and legislative branch is they are trying to ensure that people cannot get to power who will actually solve these problems and create equity in the space. So, for example, internationally, Monica's organization Gaia has uh, with a partner in uh, Manila, Philippines. Uh, Mother Earth Foundation, both prominently featured in the story of plastic, they have a solution that is, I don't know, a thousand times cheaper than uh, e even a few incinerators being built at the countrywide scale. But one of the, you know, one of the barriers to that is if you if you improve local conditions, people tend tend to benefit from that. And if they start to have expendable income, they can start being politically active. If they're not always working sort of just to feed or survive, they then can start participating in government. And that becomes an existential threat to the ruling class and the aristocracy. So I think, you know, the, people say the system is broken. And I want to say it. It's, it's not broken, it was actually designed this way. We're just starting to fully understand the skullduggery that went into creating it. If, if I could take the mic back just for one second. Um, thank you, Steph, I completely agree. And I, um, 
I also wanted to put in a, a plug, a plea for help at the federal level from all of you and from everyone who's um, in, the, um, in, the, in this webinar and panel today, because while we you know, have lots of fights at the local level to build, to stop the uh, pollution and build the new systems that, that we know we need, um, we also need to look federally to make sure that we don't have incentives that make it easier to build new incinerators or keep existing incinerators burning. So um, today's a global day of action for Gaia um, around the world. And in the US, we're focused on getting incinerators out of the Clean Futures Act, which is a bill that um, has some legs in Congress right now. And you know, while we're seeing all this, uh, this positive action, um, it's things, dirty energy is sneaking in to, to many of these uh, bills. So I'm gonna send a link here and it's pretty easy. Just click on that and sign your name. And I would really, really appreciate it um, as we send this bill. And we've had over a hundred organizations signed so far, but the more that we can get, um, the better. Thank you. Mike, you wanted to jump in? Yeah, real quick. I, you know, sort of wanted to keep score a little bit here. And um, I mean, at the end of the day, I think sometimes we Erieites uh, sort of have a tough time acknowledging this, but we are sort of, uh, uh, we are a slow growing economy, which is maybe the nice way of putting it. And at the end of the day, uh, I want to know from, and John, this could be, uh, this could involve you as well. Uh, and Absolutely, you as well, Sherry. Has there been any response as far as uh, from any of the local uh, sort of representation, uh, whether that's the mayor's office or city council, uh, towards your guys's Green New Deal uh, initiative that you guys have uh, sent to them? <laughs> uh, I'll, I mean, I'll jump in real quick. We um, a, a criticism that I've heard from a few different places is. Um, you know, because there have been grassroots community events being put on, um, you know, by groups like the Green New Deal Coalition, Penn Future, Our Water, Our Air, Our Rights, HECA, several others. Um, and the response seems to be not the content that are in these um, presentations and community discussions, but why isn't our IRG at these? Why aren't you involving, um, you know, the, the owners? Uh, so, <laughs> you know, these groups have started to um, try and fill the void there because um, many in our media and leadership uh, really are, are not asking the right questions or asking any questions at all. So to Mike's point, um, the Green New Deal Coalition just put together a large document and sent it to uh, like over 50 people in the media, leadership, business communities with basic questions that should be asked. Um, and yeah, there has there has been no response. And we did invite um, city leadership, the business community, ownership of IRG. Um, has been left out of these conversations um and yeah no no response although i i will say that um we do have one journalist uh in this conversation tonight and thank you so much um and a person from uh the business community as well who has attended uh, several of these community events and thank you very much and maybe that's all i will say on that topic Monica, Stiv, is this sort of a standard operating procedure for what you guys have seen on the national and international level where it's just like uh, silence uh, allows them to not have sort of uh, culpability and what is happening? I mean, I have a company, I don't, I've lost count uh, how many communities who have, who have been, um, you know, raised a lot of questions of, of companies and said, until we get the answers to these, you know, we don't think you should operate, you know, and that I've, I've always thought that was a super reasonable, rational approach. Um, you have every right to ask all the questions. And I, I read through the, the questions um, from the Green New Deal Coalition and I thought they were fantastic. It's like really clearly thought out um, set of questions of all the different variables and ways that this business could have negative impacts on the community. and. Um, and as a community, you have every right to have that information, to demand transpa transparency and accountability, and to um, empower your 
elected officials <laughs> to feel like they can ask those questions too and put the company on the spot to, to provide answers because we've often found um, elected officials, and I, I'm not saying this applies to Erie, I know very little about Erie, so don't take this the wrong way, but I've seen a lot of elected officials who say, well, any new business coming in, great, next. You know, And it's really important to peel back the onion and to figure out what's going on. And so I thought that set of questions was fantastic. Um, silence from a company is com completely normal. And I think it takes a political pressure and city councilors asking questions. Um, I was once, it was really interesting. I was in a situation once where a city council held a, it felt like a tribunal. It was almost like a trial um, of the company to say, okay, we have waited so long for you to answer our questions. We are gonna demand that you come. And we spent days like cross-examining each other. It was, it was so interesting. I don't think it's a legal thing. But it, it, you know, we finally got to the surface what was going on with this company and the claims they were making. Um, so I think um, it's really, really important for elected officials to feel like their constituents have their back, that um, they're not going up against the behemoth alone, that um, that you know that asking questions and demanding accountability is normal and and should be accepted. Um, so I just I want to congratulate you on that approach and on really, really pushing. And um, it could be that more organizing is still what it's going to take to get the company to answer, but at least um, you're getting the, you're sharing what the full impact could be with people who are going to have a lot of power over the, the ultimate decision. And I think. Oh, we lost you, Steph. Sorry. I think doing things, you know, my group, from why we made Story of Plastic and why we formed our own our own NGO to continue this sort of intersectional storytelling, uh, you know, that you saw in Story of Plastic. I did put a link to our new film um, that we're using um, as a basis to sort of mount for a broader doc um, centering environmental justice voices, is we need to market and storify these questions. So I think it's amazing that we have a set of questions that really get to the heart of what the negative impacts could be on a community, but those are likely going to exist in a city council hearing. And then nerds like me and Monica um, will read them, but very few people will. And so there is a tactic to storify that stuff with the lived experience of community members that says, what's this gonna do to me? This is what this is gonna do to me. And this is what this is gonna do to my aunt Martha or, or whatever. So, you know, I think in the NGO space, we have long, we've been very long on facts and data and we have been trained, you know, in the Socratic method that, you know, the truth is self-evident and when it is exposed that that creates the impetus for change. I firmly don't believe that. I believe people are really irrational, emotional beings and you have to strike them in the heart um, or you have to make them laugh to shove the truth in. And so um, I feel like investing in story and uh, storytelling devices allows you to actually frame the meta narrative. And if you can frame the meta narrative, you then create the political capital you need to start or stop something. Um, and I'm not saying it's the only piece of the puzzle, but it's one where I think we don't invest enough in. I mean, you know, to be dead honest, the, the, the story of plastic had a really hard time making it into the world because you know the NGO culture didn't think it was actually possible to create a story like this that would get to you know on Discovery Channel like they just didn't think it could happen and and that you know we're seeing that you know these these sort of uh, storytelling initiatives um, can actually shift the conversation um, at a pretty massive scale. And it's like, it's why we're on this panel right now is, is sort of like, how do we operationalize the lessons of, of story of plastic? And I certainly don't have all the answers, um, but I know at least we have a device um, that we can share that, that tells about the whole system. And it's from the perspective of the people most harmed. 
Stiv, uh, one thing, I mean, I think it's safe to say that you spend a lot of your time on the water. Um, you know, the, this proposed plastics plant is right on the bay, um, right by Lake Erie, our peninsula. This is, for our region, um, the lake and the peninsula and the bay is really everything um, for the economics of our, of our region. Um, you know, in your travels, you know, there's a lot of questions that come up with having this plant there. There's the um, wastewater from washing the plastic um you know which was an issue with a, a coke plant that we also had on the bay that was recently um closed down because it had so many violations over the years and and took forever to get to the point of cleanup which we talked about before leaving the mess behind but my my thought is the lake is so precious for all of us here what have you seen and i know this is um in the film um but maybe you can share, you know, the, the damage that can be done uh, by this industry to our most precious of resources here in Erie, Pennsylvania. About a decade ago, I was uh, a little more than a decade ago, I was a journalist and I got on a boat that went to the middle of the uh, North Atlantic garbage patch and between um Bermuda and the Azores, we came into what would the most photographable garbage patch I've ever seen. And that sort of like crazy realization that no matter what we did, we couldn't get to land for 10 days. They're like, that was the, we were that far away. And, you know, and it's hard to explain how big the ocean is until you cross it. Uh, but seeing, recognizable brands in the middle of the ocean blew my mind. And, you know, I'm from Minneapolis and I understand uh, the Great Lakes and how precious they are. And I definitely want um, uh, Dr. Mason to, 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 to round out this question because the most effective scientific research I was ever a part of was conducted in the Great Lakes. And it is because people have a personal connection to those lakes. And, and you have lots of mechanisms for multi-state and even Canada to be working on you know, those lakes because it's everybody's weekend barbecue, it's swimming, it's boating, it's uh, ice fishing, it's, you know, this is why people live there. And uh, in, in many cases, and, um, you know, in Erie, we were part of a ship, um, the, you know, working uh, to teach uh, kids how to sail technologically obsolete sailcraft. Um, but, uh, um, but fascinating, you know, I mean, just like an amazing, amazing uh, trip. And, and as soon as uh, we published this, uh, we had the biggest reaction and i had sailed 35,000 nautical miles at this point and written press releases to the new york times and and people weren't picking it up but when you mess with somebody's lake um yeah and yeah it, it's and, and the the degrees of scale and the concentration of of microplastics um in these lakes is is going to corrupt even the smallest, uh, you know, the very building blocks of the food chain. Um, and I, I really would love for, for Sam to, to drop in on this one too, uh, because this is very near and dear to her heart. Thank you, Steph. Um, yeah, I'm, um, gosh, uh, for most of what you were talking, you were, when you were talking, I, what I wanted to, to chime in on um, was about, um, there is a, a regional initiative that officially actually launched today um, by the, the Council for the Great Lakes Region um, called the Great Lakes Circular Economy Partnership, which um, Barron is, is a part of, and I'm, I'm leading the charge here in Erie. Um, and, but this is happening, you know, region, region wide, um, and it's um, actually a direct result of NOAA um, and the, the marine debris program. So we have a Great Lakes uh, NOAA marine debris um, outreach group. Um, 
that has has started this. And so, and it ties in actually with the question I think that Lynn Armel asked, which is, you know, you have people that are dependent upon these jobs. And if we take away these jobs, what do we do? You know, what happens to these people? And I think there's actually more jobs to be made in a circular economy. There's so much um, to that that can change. And if you don't know about a circular economy, I highly recommend people to, to look up um, some videos um, to, to learn about it, but it's, it's about not really owning things so much as renting them. And as a result of that, there's an incentive for companies to make things that have a long life <laughs> as opposed to things that are disposable. Um, and it's just something as simple as the light bulb that is shining on my face right now, right? Right now, there's an incentive to make that go away, right? To make it burn out in a short period of time. So I throw it out and I have to buy a new one. And that's the only way they make money, right? Companies make money is when I go out and buy something. And if instead it's a circular economy and I'm leasing that light, then you have the re exact reverse incentive where now they get money from me, regardless of whether that light burns out or not, because I'm renting it from them. And this is actually happening. There are actually like businesses that rent light. <laughs> so this isn't, I'm just not making this up. This is actually a real thing. Um, and so we're working to, to create kind of that, that circular economy here in the Great Lakes region. But to the last point that that Stiv made, you know, we we have sailed and sampled all five of the Great Lakes. Um, we're working on our taking a, a master's thesis right now that was done on work on Lake Superior and turning it into a peer-reviewed journal article. But that the the point of that study was that in Lake Superior, the largest, the most pristine of the Great Lakes, the very start of the Great Lakes chain, with has very low density of population. We already have an average of thirty thousand pieces of plastic, and that what that equates to across that entire lake surface is four point five billion pieces of plastic on Lake Superior. I mean, it's just you know. It's mind blowing, and then that flows on down, right? And so Lake um, Lake Erie with has the most densely populated. Right here, we see an average of forty six thousand. We look over in Lake Ontario, that goes up to two hundred fifty thousand pieces of plastic on average, ac strewn across this lake surface. And Lake Ontario and Lake Superior are vying for what which are the most contaminated. Lake Erie, um, just you know, kind of just that much behind. So, so this is this is very real, you know. Already, before we have um, this proposed facility producing flake, and and what is going to happen with that flake, um, and and I that's an important question that that hasn't been answered. It's been asked, um, but it hasn't been answered. I should have answered that in the reverse order because I ended on the depressing note. I want to remind people that about the circular economy, which is much more uplifting. <laughs> well, Monica, it looks like you have a comment about the circular economy as well. Yeah, I was just so glad you brought that up, Sam. Um, and I wanted to point to a report we put out recently, which is a global report on job creation through zero waste, through circular economy efforts. Um, and reuse and repair, which we already knew, it was no surprise, but create a lot more jobs than any other uh, type of approach of like handling waste. And so um, we think that's just a really important thing to share in terms of opportunities for job creation um, and local economies and compost too should not be forgotten. So anyway, if you click through on that link, um, we have a bunch of reports at the bottom of the page. And we have an industrial composter now. In Erie, Pennsylvania, well, it's actually just south of us, but we have industrial composting available to us. And I would really love, they, they hope to grow to the point um, that, that they're able to collect it curbside. So there's a lot of resources that have come through on this chat. And I think what'll be helpful is at the end, um, I can collect all of the links that have come through <laughs> and maybe put them in an email and send that out to all the attendees. Um, Cause I think that there was um, a petition maybe that, it, that has come through and some other things. And I definitely wanna know about that industrial 
compost that you've got going on because I want to know where we can put our compost. I have no idea. Um, anyway, there's been a lot of comments that have come through um, since we've been talking. And um, one that's been repeated. So, <laughs> so I want to make sure that um, we, we get it out there. So one from uh, the Benedictine sisters again, talking about how um, going back to the idea of stories. So we talked about um, stories and one about the Good Friday pilgrimage for peace is focused on racism. Um, one of the stops in the online video is proposed plastics processing plant as the example environmental of environmental racism hoping that raises awareness and gives an opening for conversations around the questions from the Green New Deal. So that was a, a nice comment there. Um, and this is kind of following up to also the Green New Deal um, questions that went out from Janice. She says, even before IRG can begin sorting and flaking plastic, they have to obtain the plastic material. Their plan is to receive the plastic waste from places within a 750 mile radius of Erie 50 or more trucks per day will be driving here from those locations, bringing a great deal of pollution to us. We have to talk about this too. So I don't know if anybody wanted to comment on that. That just went to the panelists, not the attendees. Anybody? Well, I had a practical question about whether the Good Friday Pilgrimage for Peace is available before Good Friday because um, oh. <laughs> uh, that might be a great resource to share, but it might not be ready yet. Um, so thanks for sharing that. Mm -hmm. uh, let me ask a question about like proactive things that communities might be able to do. Is there anything that they can do? You know, a concept that's, or a, a term that's come up a lot in meetings I've been in is uh, consent. Um, you know, and I'm curious what you all think about like uh, community benefits agreements um, and anything that a community can do proactively if you have any ideas to, um, you know, kind of stop some of these things before they start. Does anybody have any advice there? I mean, there's a few, I mean, I, I'm jumping in because there's quiet and I, I think yes they're you know getting getting things like curriculum level stuff into schools um and having opportunities for the coming generation to understand these systems and their problems will affect how they you know manifest when they get into leadership um opportunities within those communities so i'm very pro education on the youth and the front end of things. Um, and then I think also building sort of intersectionality to more privileged parts of that community and less privileged parts of that community. Um, having mechanisms where um, more resourced people can, can uh, help to uplift less resourced people you know, because what I find a lot, one of the biggest problems in intersectional organizing, um, and in any city is going to have rich and poor people, you know, uh, everywhere on planet Earth, um, except for maybe Liechtenstein or, or Switzerland. But um, the one of the biggest barriers is people are afraid to talk to each other because it, and, it, and if you're liberals, liberals are 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 afraid of putting their foot in their mouth, and so they avoid these things and they stay in silos. So, intersections, 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 and and inclusivity, radical inclusivity in um, community groups and building those vehicles, so that it's not just one one part of the community that has representation. There has to be that opportunity and a safe space for those people to come together um, so they can speak to what the entire community needs and wants. Thank you. Erica, do we have any uh, more questions here from the chat? 
And we'll, we'll take a couple more and then we will wrap up. This has been awesome. Thank you, everybody. Sam, did you want to jump in there? I, I don't know. Oh, no, I was just saying that there's one more question from in the Q&A. Um, we're seeing legislation pop up in many states, including PA supporting post-consumer. And yeah, this is Ford Monica, so I'll read it out loud, even though you're typing an answer. <laughs> um, supporting post-consumer plastic uses like chemical and advanced recycling. I should put those in quotes, chemical and advanced recycling, especially advanced um, that include plastic to fuel and uses like coast repla Coke replacement. I think legislators see this as a technological solution to the plastics problem. How do citizens and environmental organizations get ahead of these efforts and bring the conversation back to reduction, corporate responsibility and circular economies? Um, I, I did just have to answer I know, <laughs> but for everybody it. else, because that would only go <laughs> to, to the person you asked I'll, it. I'll say it out loud in case you haven't seen the Q&A, because sometimes we don't all see that stuff. Um, yeah. But my basic advice is it's great that, you know, to be informed and on top of it. And I think it's important to be proactive and, like you said, and inform legislators that community groups aren't going to be looking forward to something like that. In fact, they're going to oppose it and instead uh, demand that legislation actually reduce plastic itself. You know, we need strong state policy and we need strong federal policy to reduce plastic production and reduce single use plastics. Um, and we, I, I, I think you're right. The American Chemistry Council and others, you know, are, are just pushing um, this plastic burning in a lot of different ways. And when we researched um, chemical recycling in the US, we found that most of the facilities are basically burning in the end. So, um, you know, whatever you want to call it, a lot of them ended up with mostly burning. So, but, you know, let's just be clear what, what we're talking about. And I think um, proactive lobbying is the way to go. And I sent a link um, in the answer to if you're like, what the heck are you guys talking about? This sounds crazy. Um, Here's some more info on that too. Thank you. Mike, did you have a question? Uh, I did, and before we do, and we're gonna wrap here up here shortly, I just wanted to thank Sam, Monica. Thank you guys so much, so much, so much. Really, really, really appreciate you guys uh, taking your valuable time to share with us today. Uh, real quick, we are a film podcast. Stiv, uh, is there anything else besides uh, continue to uh, champion the documentary that you have coming up that we can be uh, looking forward to? Shameless you know, plug. Shameless plug time. Go for it. Shameless plug. We um um we're we're drilling down really deeply into the environmental justice perspective domestically in the United States in our new film work. And we're we're we just released the first in a series um with, which we're calling Plastic Justice right now, um, called Breathe This Air. Um, but we're gonna be sort of we're looking to mount um, a new feature length documentary that will sort of focus on, on the Gulf South as a cautionary tale for the Ohio River Valley. And um, hundreds of partners are involved already. Um, and so we're gonna be uh, raising money um, to do this, but at a, at a much bigger scale than Story of Plastic. Um, I'm really heartened by how far the our first film um, has gotten, um, but I think there's room to go much farther, and uh, um, we're we're interested in in doing things at scale and getting to new audiences. So please check out that film, and um, don't give us money. Give the subjects uh, of the film money, um, and and that's sort of how we operate. Thank you, Erica. Do we have any last questions? To wrap up, you're muted. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, we have one last question from Margaret Taylor at the local university level. Are there plastics engineering researchers investigating non-petroleum-based biodegradable plastic? Um, PLA is the kind of the biggest um, biodegradable non petroleum-based plastic, um, and it's it's on the market. We 
we have um, researching it is difficult because it really only breaks down in an industrial composting facility. And we just became aware that we have an industrial composting facility because it came online in the middle of a global pandemic. So um, I won't say that we've got a lot of research happening at Barrend and, and for those who are not an eerie Barron's number one um, undergraduate program is plastics engineering technology. So um, we are creating the next. So I, I won't say that we have a lot of research going on in that that area, but obviously I would like to see that change. Well, this has been great. Thank you, um, thank you all so much for your time again, Stiv, Monica, Sam, and everyone who attended the Q&A. This has been great. Uh, if you're listening to this after the event, please seek out uh, the documentary, The Story of Plastic, Gaia, and on the Film Society of Northwestern Pennsylvania Facebook page, we will share out um, the links and um, every everything that we've linked to, basically, as well. Thank you all. This has been great. Thank you for having us. Thanks for having us. Monica for sharing the stage.